Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Hey everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Before we get started, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in my phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You could go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to download presentation. Second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q and a session at the end, please click the ellipse icon with 3 dots labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q and a window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q and a for the benefit of those on the phone. I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you have a technical issue during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. With that said, I would like to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Jennifer Bloom has 12 plus years of expertise in cybersecurity algorithm development and advanced statistical data science methodologies for DOD and intelligence agency customers. She has designed and developed application programming interfaces, machine learning algorithms, and critical cyber infrastructure for industry and government clients. She is currently the principal scientist at Optech Systems Incorporated, a company that specializes in optimization for modeling and simulation, where she utilizes her data science skills to address customer needs and finds new business opportunities. Dr. Bloom is the second black woman to ever graduate with a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Michigan. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Let me just make sure that I'm gonna share what's relevant. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. So once again, I'm Jen Bloom. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you to CSIAC for letting me present at this webinar. And of course, thank you to the audience. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever your time zone is. Thank you very much for making the time uh, to listen to me talk today. I'm going to be discussing optimization techniques, improving effectiveness for defense simulation models. So we're gonna go through a few topics. I'm gonna to go over what is simulation, what is optimization, why we can get the best of both worlds by, doing, uh, by utilizing them both, why it's important, the different kinds of approaches such as metaheuristics, as well as the use cases. I'm assuming we may have some defense analysts hopefully on the line and hopefully this will uh, be more applicable to scenarios that you're using in your everyday work. So first off with simulation, what is that? Simulation is the imitation of an operation of a real world, real world process. So your real world, world systems are often uncertain and they're complex. And this is why we simulate. 
So what we need is a very powerful method to assure a model is as close as possible to a real world system. And we can do things with discrete events versus continuous. What I mean by that is we're dealing with uh, time managed events. So with discrete, we're looking at interesting uh, events over say every five minutes, looking at something interesting versus continuous where you may be looking at something every millisecond. And then of course we have live and virtual um, versus uh, constructive simulations. So with optimization, so we, I just went over what simulation is now with optimization. Optimization is a prescriptive methodology. You're trying to look for the best possible outcome from a real, uh, for a real world system. And so since we're again trying to model this, uh, there are different uh, mathematics that we can use to define this. What I have here on the third bullet point is just a, a generic equation for or generic formulas for what we would use. This is not all encompassing. You will see different variants of this depending on what you're trying to do. But here we're trying to minimize uh, f of x, which is our, um, our objective function. It's subject to x, which is your variable, and you have your um, uppercase omega, which is your constraints. And then you have uh, your g of i and your h of i, um, or sorry, h of j uh, functions. And so the last three bullet points, what I uh, want to um, point to is with the linear versus nonlinear, you can think of that as um, that's dealing with the constraints, that's dealing with your omega. You have your continuous versus discrete, which is your X variable. And then you have your single versus your um, multi-objective, which is your function. So in this case, I'm saying you want to minimize um, F of X, which is your objective. Okay, so we just did a crash course in simulation, optimization, and so, you know, what happens if you uh, want to combine the two? So this first bullet point is talking about constructive simulation. So they're, they're often black boxes where you have uh, given input results and a random output. So here's my poor woman's version of you have X going through a simulation, giving you some form of output. And so, again, you know, we want the best of both worlds. Things are uh, uncertain, so you'd probably want to run this a bunch of times, different replications, to get an understanding of what you're trying to simulate. In optimization, uh, at least one of your functions is going to be determined by the simulation model. You have your f of x, which is your expectation. And so uh, what you want to do is you want to set it around this expectation. So you're putting your X into this and you're getting in your output. And so uh, one thing that my company Optech does is that it does do with the combining of both the simulation and optimization, giving you the best of both worlds. And so it can uh, succeed where others have failed. For example, in this last bullet point, you know, you can have classic optimization solutions can break down, in which case you need to use other possibilities and options. Okay, so we've combined the two simulation optimization. So, you know, you want to find out what set of models uh, specifications are going to lead you to optimal performance. And so, you know, again, I have here uh, my poor woman's uh, artistic rendition of what's going on. You have your input parameters that are going through a simulation model and then out uh, and then you're getting out your model responses. Again, this is something um, there's software tools that can do this. Um, one case in point is what Optech does specifically with, uh, with one of our tools, OpDef, but it is using the simulation optimization um, software and methodologies. Again, reiterating, giving you the best of both worlds. So why is this, why is simulation optimization uh, even required? So, you know, you have these complex models, you have a lot of variables and constraints, and you have a lot of uncertainty you're unlikely to get the result that you want. If you're trying to find an optimal answer, there are a lot of possible solutions. The question a lot, uh, yeah, the question is you have a lot of possible solutions, but are you getting the solution uh, that you want, uh, the solution that you're exactly looking for in this exploration space? And so with a pure optimization, you're uh, unable to you know, model certain complexities and uncertainties. You have different dynamics of scenarios. One thing I'm going to show later in the use cases is, you know, when you're do, uh, designing a mission scenario, there are lots of things that can happen. You have many different kinds of assets, different kinds of weapons, 
uh, different kinds of you know, directions that things are coming from, a huge space to look at. And so simulation optimization is removing these inabilities by combining both approaches. So again, total solution, so recap, total solution requires both capabilities. You needed the integrated two-step solution, simulation, and then optimization. Both are needed, uh, but alone neither, uh, but if you do either or, neither is sufficient. Simulation gives you an understanding um, modeling in terms of for uncertainty, and the optimization enables the management of that uncertainty. So I have here, um, again, I'm hoping there's some defense analysts that are in the audience today, but these are just uh, an, a list of some common uh, simulation analyst tasks. So what you have here, you would use, uh, an analyst would may use a simulation model to figure out future acquisition and investment strategy, um, I mentioned earlier, try, you're trying to design particular scenarios. So you're trying to fix, you know, uh, what's the best mix of assets or resources you have to um, optimize, you know, chance of success. You want to counter certain threats. You want to meet uh, mission uh, operational objectives. Uh, or perhaps you're given a conops uh, under which you need to operate. You, there are certain requirements that you need to meet. And so, uh, you know, you're trying to figure out certain design parameters for a specific system uh, that you need to, you know, match or find solutions for. And so, wouldn't it be great if you had something that would allow you to figure all this out in uh, as fast uh, and efficient means as possible? So, what I have here is, uh, you know, the, the title is a bit of a misnomer. This should really be some of the challenges that analysts face. And so again, uh, it would be great if we had unlimited time and uh, unlimited, uh, uh, unlimited money. Um, one thing you know, you're, you're striving for, of course, is also to reduce cost, but you know, you're, you need to run, you're trying to run a limited number of excursions. You're doing all of this manually. Um, sometimes uh, you know, you're scripting, you're, you know, one thing we've heard back from some of our, uh, some of our clients uh, is that, you know, when you try to uh, redo certain scenarios or you're redoing certain simulations, it's very labor and time intensive. You have a limited amount of uh, time to explore the space, again, limited amount of money. Uh, there are so many complex combinations that can go on for your simulation models. And sometimes you can rarely optimize. So you're not, you're really not necessarily finding, you know, your true um, multi-objective. And again, you're manually doing this, all the post data collection, all of the analysis, wouldn't it be great if some of that was automated? And, uh, and again, that's something that my company does with our tool Opdef, which is um, another uh, defense uh, software tool. But these are some of the things that would make it easier for the analysts. So the, the software is doing you know, the, the hard number crunching uh, stuff. It's automating it to make it easier for the analysts to focus on other things and get the answers that they need at the end of the day. So uh, this is just demonstrating. Hey, what we have. Yep. Not to interrupt. Can you uh, please uh, minimize the uh, DTIC pop, DTIC web ups, WebEx pop up? Oh, uh, apologies. Yeah, it's, it's hiding some of the content. There you go. You. Appreciate it. All right, sorry. Hopefully, so I'll just read that out loud. Studies are often behind schedule and the simulation run and analysis period is shortened. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this uh, demonstrates, this is showing what you're going through with your um, optimization and your simulation, how you can pair the two. And so if we start at the right, you're giving um, your simulation a set of input parameters. It goes through the simulation instance. Uh, uh, your outputs are collected by your optimizer, which is trying to, you know, meet that expectation, try to, you know, figure out what you're trying to get to your objective. And then, you know, as it gets closer, when it's exploring the space, it'll send those updated parameters back in through the simulation. And this process continues in an iterative loop uh, until it stop, you know, until it either reaches the answer, and that could be at the determination of the analyst, um, you know, uh, or, you know, you can set it to do, you know, just a certain amount of cycles just to see if it's going in the, uh, the right direction. Again, you need that, that analyst subject matter expertise um, to make sure that it's uh, all going correctly. 
the simulation instance, uh, again, can be anything. It can be on your local machine. It can also be uh, an HPC. You can do parallel processing. So this isn't necessarily, you know, limited to uh, just one instance on your laptop, say, for example. Okay, so um, gone through simulation, but, you know, we're all now experts in simulation optimization and then simulation optimization. Um, I'm going to go through some of the approaches uh, that are being used. And I'm gonna start off with just some background and heuristics. So, you know, what is that? It is a technique which seeks your near optimal solutions uh, at a reasonable cost. However, it is unable to determine whether you know, the optimal solution uh, has been met, which is why you wanna do meta heuristics, which is what I'm going to focus on in this case. This is what, uh, you know, for example, uh, my company's software OpDef does. Um, that's the underlying backbone for you know, these solutions for simulation optimization, but it is a heuristic that guides another heuristic, hence the term meta in, uh, in the word, but a master strategy that guides and modifies your other procedures uh, in a quest for local optimality. And I just wanna uh, also focus on this reference here for taboo search. Uh, I highly recommend you read this paper. It's by Manuel Laguna and Fred Glover, who are also um, two of the founders of my company. So first off, let's give some heuristic examples. One is the uh, traveling salesman problem, as well as the knapsack problem and local search. So um, I don't know if uh, who in the audience is familiar with the traveling salesman problem. So I'll just you know just give a brief um, explanation of what that is. Uh, TSP or traveling salesman problem asks for a given uh, list of cities and distances between each pair of cities. What is the shortest possible route where this salesman can visit each city exactly once and then return to your origin city? Now, you may think, okay, we can just try every possibility and then we'll determine the answer, uh, a brute force method. Uh, normally, you know, I, that would be the first thing you tried. However, uh, it was discovered that, you know, it, even if you get to um, 20 cities, the amount of time it would take to compute all of that is the number of cities factorial. So if you did 20 cities, it would be 20 factorial would be the length of time to determine uh, what the shortest route is. And so that just basically becomes really infeasible. So uh, one of the options is to do the nearest neighbor. So with the nearest neighbor, you're, it's a greedy approach, greedy meaning you wanna finish things in as short a time as possible. So, you know, with this approach, you start in an arbitrary city and you repeatedly select the nearest unvisited city until all the cities have been visited. It's going to yield a shorter, you know, quicker answer, but it might not necessarily be the optimal one. And so that's just an example of, uh, for the traveling salesman problem, the knapsack problem is something similar. I think we've all uh, either hiked or gone on a plane and you know you have what what can I prioritize I have all this stuff that I need to fit into a bag uh, but you know some things are higher priority than others so how do I determine and how do I fit what's needed inside in this case a knapsack then we have some meta heuristic examples neighborhood based as well as evolutionary or population based uh, for the neighborhood based, you have simulated annealing, which is really just um, an approximate global optimization for in a large search space. With taboo search, again, uh, I want to I highly recommend looking at the reference by um, by Manuel Laguna and Fred Glover. But taboo search is a procedure for solving an optimization problem, uh, and it's designed to guide other methods to escape the the problem of going into a local, being trapped essentially in a local minima. So say for example, you know, I, I found an answer, um, but in a global space, is it, the, is it the global, if I'm looking at say at a uh, two dimensional XY plane and I have something that's curving and I have different um, peaks and valleys, if I found a particular peak, how do I know that that's the highest peak if that's what I'm looking for? Maybe I just didn't explore enough. 
So um, this technique is something that uh, helps you avoid those pitfalls. And it also uses memory functions so that you remember the solutions that have already been explored. And so it allows you to uh, do, it's a great search strategy for trying to um, explore a large space. Then you have um, the evolution, uh, evolutionary or population-based scatter search, uh, which I've used uh, kind of the sibling to taboo search, which is the, uh, you use subsets of an initial population uh, and high candidate solutions to help you find good solutions. And then you have genetic algorithms, which has been inspired by biology to use natural selection where you have different generations of solutions. Uh, and this is just uh, an additional slide, which is on scatter search, just to show, you know, uh, some of the history of it and how, you know, you're trying to uh, combine restraints and in integer programming. You're trying to combine solutions to create uh, new reference, uh, new reference solutions. And so this is just a graphical representation of what's going on. I want to mention when I mentioned taboo search as well as uh, scatter search and the genetic algorithms. Uh, that is involved with machine learning. So things are getting smarter the more they explore. So with this graphical representation, I have A, B, and C. Uh, but if I combine A, B, and C, I'll get, say, point 0.1. And if I combine points B and C, I'm going to get point 0.2. And I do something uh, similar with these different combinations to get additional data points to learn more about the space. And again, you know, we're learning as we go. So this is where machine learning can be applied. Um, and I'm just showing this as a, a graphical rep representation because I think figures can hopefully give a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So as we're exploring and we're doing these new combinations, which are giving new solutions, we, uh, we need to be careful that we're not uh, violating any constraints. So for example, you know, we are only operating within um, our certain, you know, uh, are certain constraints, but perhaps our newest solution is outside of that. So one thing you would do with cons uh, constraint mapping is that, you know, you want to try to find a feasible solution as opposed to an infeasible one that's as close as possible to um, the, inf the infeasible trial solution. And that this is just a really quick and simple um, explanation of that. We found uh, a solution that is outside the space, which is represented in dark gray for what we're looking for. Uh, and we want to try to find something as close as possible uh, using constraint mapping to you know, find out the best possible, most more feasible solution that is closest to that boundary space. OK, so I'm wrapping up uh, the uh, simulation optimization uh, methodology, as well as the definitions. We've gone kind of through a whirlwind of why we would use uh, simulation optimization together. Uh, so again, real world systems, they're very complex. They're often modeled using simulation or optimization. You have simulation, which is a very powerful methodology to try to get to as close as possible to a real world system. You also have optimization, which is needed for prescriptive analysis, uh, where you're trying to again, find your optimal solution. And then you have uh, the combination of the two which is simulation optimization. So you have software that helps automate things for you to help you run through those iter iterative processes, um, as I demonstrated when you're going through the input parameters, which is collecting outputs, going back through the optimizer, which is going back through the, simu uh, the simulation uh, in an automated fashion to help improve um, or you know, lessen uh, the labor intensive work uh, for the analyst. So now I'm going to move on to the use cases, uh, which hopefully um, you know, will uh, you know, resonate with some, some of you in the audience with how this can be applied in real world scenarios. So this is one example uh, I have here on the right, just a uh, notional scenario uh, using AFSIM. So you know, we have a bunch of uh, red threats uh, on land, and then we have the incoming blue forces. Uh, you can use, uh, you want to optimize your blue response. So, you know, you want to optimize the location and configuration of your blue forces to meet certain objectives. So say you want to maximize the number of leakers. I say leakers, but it can also be maximum number of hits on your red, uh, on your red assets. Um, 
And you also would possibly want to, you know, minimize your number of blue uh, resources while you're at it. So maximize number of hits, but also minimize um, how many blue assets you need to get those maximum number of hits. You can also use it uh, for space. Um, so with simulation optimization. So you want, say you want to get maximal satellite coverage. So you have, you know, different um, satellites in a constellation. You want to optimize your target coverage by varying certain input parameters. So you want to vary the orbits. Maybe you want to vary the number and type of the spacecraft. Maybe you want to alter uh, the configuration of the constellation. And you can also uh, add constraints to it to designate, uh, you know, which uh, areas of the globe you wish to cover, whether there are certain thresholds, uh, you know, with satellites, everyone, you know, is competing for, um, for its usage. And so you want to look for coverage threshold thresholds for priority targets and areas. You can also use simulation optimization in, uh, for, in cybersecurity. So uh, I've titled it cyber optimization and analysis. So, you know, similar to what I showed with the blue versus uh, red forces on, the, you know, one of the previous slides, you can think of this in terms of software um, cyber architecture. So you want to optimize the solution to minimize loss of function if you're um, enduring against a cyber attack. So you can explore different scenarios in a cyber kill chain that would be the most detrimental to you. And then you can kind of test the limits of your IT system and try to identify which key components have to be protected at all costs. So again, this is changing certain parameters based on certain configurations of your red or you know, your red cyber attack. And then one, uh, one additional space uh, example is that you can do launch and deployment optimization. So we want to, you know, we need to get our satellites into space and to do that, you need to launch them up there. So you want to op optimize the launch parameters, but you want to minimize the cost and also uh, meet your mission parameters. So, you know, cost is huge, so we want to minimize that. We have uh, different subsystems, which uh, their performance would affect the launch vehicle. So again, these are some parameters. You want to look at uh, the flight trajectory and you want to find, you know, the, the optimal one. And you can vary certain parameters like initial launch angle, aim point, uh, altitude, speed, et cetera. You can use the, uh, another example is for training scenarios. So you can optimize training scenarios to meet training requirements. So you uh, have a bunch of students that are you know, taking some sort of uh, training assessment, you can tailor individual training scenarios for a large group of uh, attendee, uh, trainees. So you, know, you could say you have people uh, who are you know, slightly more advanced, they're you know, taking, it just, uh, they're taking uh, this training assessment just to uh, you know, meet requirements or meet the baseline uh, for their skills versus say a pure beginner. And you can tailor this accordingly so that each one is, each individual is, challenge, uh, is challenged. Uh, you can also provide post event reviews uh, with automated discovery of optimal choices. So, say, for example, you're going through these training assessments, these training tests. Uh, perhaps, you know, you're, uh, the student made certain decisions that they decided was the best one. There is the possibility where, you know, afterwards it could pop up saying, hey, you made, you know, a really good decision, um, but in, if, like in the future, possibly you may want to consider this one. Yours, say, had an 85% chance of success for the mission, but maybe this alternative that we recommend to you uh, is a 90% chance of success. So again, this is being tailored to the individual and helping them, helping the students discover optimal choices. And with that, um, you were now all experts in uh, optimization and simulation. Um, I know this is roughly about 30 minutes, but I want to leave time for questions. Uh, what I have here on the, the right is uh, a QR code taking you to my company's LinkedIn page. I am certified in data privacy, so I will tell you that this QR code is legit, so you don't need to worry. Um, but if you're uncomfortable with that, please feel free to email me separately. Um, and again, I will uh, wait for questions and 
If I cannot answer any of them, or if it requires a more uh, detailed discussion, uh, please contact me and I'm happy to take it offline and hopefully give you the answers that you need. And with that, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat, uh, so we'll start the Q and A session now. Um, the first question comes from Robert. He says, "How would you use AI ML to help optimize optimize the data and the model optimizations?" Uh, so I guess I'd have to say when you say optimize, I can say optimize the data, but I can I I'm not sh I think I need some clarity on that one. But um, optimize. Did you say sorry the model specifications? Yes, you said, uh, how would you use AI ML to optimize the data and the model optimization? Uh, so, with AI ML, uh, one thing that we're doing is that with the automated procedures, so I mentioned taboo search and all of that, that's something where you're actually, um, things are getting smarter as it goes. So, you can actually, one of the things that we're, we're doing is actually helping training or providing pre training data. For models, uh, so that they can actually, so say neural network models, so that they can um, learn the best way to meet mission objectives. So, uh, yeah, that's that's one one example uh, for what I would do. But to optimize, maybe maybe it's the data that is the most useful. I would say uh, you could use uh, first. You would have to uh, find uh, some sort of corpus data. That's the data that you prefer. And then you can um, use AI ML to train it to say this is the particular kind of data that you want. I do know that one of the challenges, uh, especially in government, but also um, commercial as well, is that you have so much data, you don't know what's useful. And a lot of it's being archived, which you know takes up a lot of resources and storage and cost. So you'd want to have a um, you know, a, a basic building block, I guess, of what you're looking for and then train. Uh, train a model to use AI ML to look at, you know, what's needed in the future so that hopefully you can, you know, find out what data is most useful to you. But again, you would also need a human in the loop uh, to check to make sure that it's actually what you're looking for. Thank you. Our next question comes from Clarence. He says, how do you optimize with a simulation model that cannot be characterized by a linear set of equations? Um, I actually will probably have to get back to you on that one because uh, I, yeah, I think it requires a more in depth discussion. So I would actually ask them, can you please email me so we can, so we can talk about that more in depth. It's, it, I, it's not necessarily a simple answer. No problem. Uh, the next question from Robert, what about the linking of these to digital twins for true real world scenarios? So digital twin is where you're trying to, you know, replicate uh, an exact system. So with um, simulation optimization software, uh, it doesn't necessarily care what the model is. So if you if you have a certain number of inputs that you're trying to optimize, that's one thing. But with digital twins, you're most likely looking to see uh, how you can capture um, a particular system. So say, for example, I'm a water engineer. And I want to look at, uh, you know, how long uh, particular pipe systems are going to last. And you're essentially using it to uh, predict uh, when things will fail or when things will break. Um, and that's one of the, the uses of digital twins. But if you wanted to use it, say, for example, what is uh, the best way for us to originally design this water system? then that's something that simulation optimization could help with. Uh, you, you, you would help optimize um, digital twins. Thanks. Our next question is from Merrick. He says, how do we handle con constraint mismatch, i.e. when our operational data shows different results to our initial viable search space? Um, so if your results are showing, I'm sorry, they're showing conflicting, is that what you said? Uh, yes. Yes, he says, how do we handle constraint mismatch, i.e. when our operational data shows different results to our initial viable search space? So um, this lends to that one slide I showed where, you know, if you're outside of your constraints and, you know, you let's say in this case, um, from what I understand, you actually can't get a feasible solution 
um, if you're running into those issues, I'm curious if it may be uh, if something needs to be tweaked within the model itself, if all of your solutions are nowhere near what your constraints are, I would, I would say you'd have to take another look to see if the correct question is being asked or if anything needs to be tweaked uh, the way you're designing that particular model. Or it might actually be indicative, yeah, so it might be indicative, maybe there's a particular bias, or, you know, it might, might, I would use it as insight actually to see if I'm asking the right question. But if you're just like, I need these answers today, and this, these answers are not possible and not useful, um, I would, you know, the one thing I guess I could recommend is that, you know, uh, to go back and see, uh, maybe make some, some different assumptions um, before you, uh, assumptions when you're generating those answers. Thank you. Our next question from Patrick, please speak to quantum and the impact of qubits and optimization models. Is this being simulated right now? Um, I believe so, but I don't know for sure. And that's something I'll have to get back to you on. So please reach out to me so we can have a separate discussion. Um, so I can also bring in some of my, sub, uh, some additional subject matter experts to discuss that. Okay. Uh, the next question from Alex, what products and techniques does Optech use to succeed? MATLAB, Julia, Mathematica, C++, Python? So, let me see. So, what products to succeed? So, um, so, so the, what Optech, the, in the software itself, um, you know, it uses, utilizes Java, you're using Python, but uh, what our software integrates with, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if your particular model is being, uh, is you, is done using C++ or Mathematica or MATLAB, we can integrate with anything. So I would say in that sense, it's language agnostic, but the Optech software itself, um, the, the basis is in um, Python, um, Java, and perhaps a few others. Yeah, those are the main two. Okay, next question from Arthur. What is the optimal gradient free method for training deep neural networks on waveform data sets? Mm -hmm. I'd actually have to get back to you on that one as well. Um, so please, Arthur Lobo, um, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think it requires a more slightly more detailed discussion. So I'd like to talk about that one offline. Okay. Uh, next question from Edward. How do you handle the computing efficiency of simulation optimization? Does your platform provide such as optimal computing budget allocation? So with computing uh, efficiency, um, I'll speak to Optech uh, as an example, but one thing we do take into account is uh, CPU processing power and you know, CPU usage. Uh, the platform that we use, uh, we try to um, optimize that by saying, like if you have a particular number of resources, um, I mentioned in uh, one of the graphics when you're going through the optimizer in the simulation, um, you can do parallel processing. So, you know, you can budget, say, a certain number of nodes. You can do things uh, in batch. So, in that case, uh, in that sense, you can do uh, compute allocation. Thank you. Uh, next question from Arthur. What is your opinion of Karis Turner for optimizing hyperparameters? Arthur, you are my favorite. I think you're my favorite for asking questions that require more detailed explanations. Um, so I'm gonna I'm making a list of all the ones you're asking, Arthur, so we can answer them all at once. Um, but again, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's something that my colleagues would definitely know. Okay. Uh, next question for Merrick: The basic model you introduced relies on data convergence within a multi-dimensional space, which which fails to handle competing interests. What strategies do you use for contextual objective prioritization? Uh, relies on data convergence. What strategies do you use for context contextual opt objective prioritization? So it really does depend on uh, the model we're interfacing with. I, I'll also make sure I'll get back to you on this one for my colleagues. But what what I what I think I can answer is that. Um, if you do have competing interests and you do need uh, and you do need to prioritize the using um, a combination of taboo search, scatter search, and a few others, if there are competing interests, uh, 
the R software will, I think, possibly indicate that, but I'll actually have to think about that more. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on that one. Uh, a couple more questions here. Mm -hmm. um, next question from Arthur. What is the best method for barren plateau mitigation in the cost function at startup usable for quantum neural network? Uh, so plateau mitigation, the cost function. So I, uh, off the top of my head, I would actually say, um, I think scatter search would be one of them, but I, uh, I don't know if there, I, I'm sure that there are others, but that's the one I can think of off the top of my head. Thank you. Next question from Randall. What is a state of the art paper comparing different algorithms, particle swarm, genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, et cetera? State of the art paper. Uh, so I can't speak to particle swarm, but uh, some, so with, but definitely with the et cetera, um, I would say if you're looking for white papers to read, it's definitely the Manuel Laguna and Fred Glover. They've written several papers. Um, actually, and Fred Glover, he has his own Wikipedia page. Uh, I would recommend you taking a look at uh, all of his, uh, the references to his papers because taboo search is um, uh, state of the art for using that. So I would refer you to that one. Thanks. Uh, next question from Cole. There has been a recent influence to develop DOD policy for modeling and simulation VBNA. How is VBNA affected? by optimization efforts, which may lead to results outside of the model's original constraint space, or just any considerations that optimization should consider relevant to VBNA. So with VBNA, we've actually, so Optech um, has actually used um, with AIML to help with VBNA. Um, if you do have results outside of the model's original constraint space, um, or just any considerations that optimization should consider. So, um, yeah, so if you have things outside of the result space, it would require subject matter, subject matter expertise to determine one um, is if these results are infeasible, do we ignore them or is it indicating that something bigger is going on? And so um, I think a question was actually asked earlier about this, but uh, specifically uh, with VVNA, if your things are happening, if a lot, if all of your answers or most of them are happening outside of your constraint space, and you're not quite sure, you know, everything that you're doing with constraint mapping isn't bringing you any closer to the boundary, then, you know, one thing that's that can be done and that can help with VVNA is working on your assumptions, which is something that Optech has done um, when it has tried to, when it has helped with projects with VVNA. Um, Considerations that options for yeah, but I think that's 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 what I'll say about that one. Thanks. The next question from Russ: How does one know whether an optimal solution has been found or merely a feasible one? In the same vein, what criteria or strategy is used to claim a global solution has been found rather than a local one? So the criteria and strategies is actually the meta heuristics that I that I spoke of. So that helps you find the global um, optimal result. And so that helps you um, escape that trap of finding a, you know, a, a local solution. Um, and, you know, how do you know that you found the, the optimal solution um, or merely a feasible one? That has to do with how, you know, much time you have to explore this space. And one thing that the meta heuristics methodology does, as well as, say, for example, OpDef, is that it um, searches the space uh, in a you know in a in a smart, efficient way to explore as much as possible while focusing uh, while avoiding the traps of your local solutions and hopefully getting you to that global solution. Um, but again, you know, like you you are have to go within the bounds of some of the subject matter expertise to you know hopefully put you in roughly the right direction. All right. Our next question from Mark, can you give us some examples of cyber optimization? Yes. So um, with some of the with the cyber architecture I mentioned, um, so say, for example, I have some IT system and I want to do, say, penetration testing or I want to do some vulnerability assessment. Um, I can do uh, different levels of what is critical, what would cause, you know, essentially a complete failure of the entire system to go down. 
in terms of um, optimizing it, I could say for, you know, I definitely need uh, this server or, you know, I'm joking, but I definitely need this printer or this laptop. These definitely cannot go down. If I'm talking, say, you know, um, server one is more important than server two, but they're both connected by this particular network, um, I can show, I can use optimization to figure out, well, do those two servers need to be connected in that way? Or can I, you know, place it uh, in a slightly different ways of the architecture so that if there was a red attack and it was using a particular means of attack, that one would, the server two, which is to me more important than server one, uh, would have a less chance of uh, going down. Um, and I will say that uh, that is something that Optech uh, has explored. There are currently many different um, cyber models that uh, we can interact with. Uh, similar to say, for example, AppSim or something like Storm, where we're just given different parameters and figuring out which is the best one to minimize um, critical failure of your IT system, whatever that IT system is. Great. Our next question from Alex. Where do you see simulation optimization field in five years? What are the most important current research areas? So uh, simulation optimization in five years, what I'm hoping for is that, uh, you know, more and more of it is being automated because that definitely seems to be uh, the thing that the analysts need. The most uh, important current research areas, I think, are the ones that are focusing on, uh, you know, minimizing uh, CPU processing power, the ones that are um, highlighting how things can be integrated into a larger unified picture. So one of the you know, uh, challenges in government is you have many different systems, um, but you want them all to interact together and you want them all to um, be accessible uh, or privileged access to different, um, different parties with different, who have you know, different levels of classification that they're uh, able to access. But um, with simulation optimization, um, what I'm hoping for is that uh, things like OpDef, whatever, will be, uh, you know, utilized more in those, you know, unified, uh, centralized software architecture spaces, um, and that, you know, we'll see that people are learning how much it actually improves or lessens their workload, and that, you know, that it's really uh, easy to integrate, and that, you know, it becomes, I guess, less less scary. Um, I think people sometimes get a little bit inundated with different kinds of software and they're like, use this one, use that one. But I, I'm hoping that, you know, as the years progress, people see how easy it is to integrate into their systems and that it'll be used uh, more prevalently. Thank you. Uh, I think this is the last question we have so far uh, from Merrick. Does your system allow for dynamic constraints and context Context specific constraints, i.e., when entering hot zone asset survival becoming more important. We often struggle with global optimizers not being able to escape Pareto optimal minima. So, yes, our system does allow for um, dynamic constraints, but it's not it's not real time or anything like that in particular. Um, but uh, that's, I guess, something that we you know we're we're hoping. To do that, it can be you know when you're um, doing those dynamic constraints uh, and specific constraints that um, you know when you're trying to do something fast and you want your assets to survive that um, you know will have the processing speed and um, be able to explore the space in such an efficient way that you're actually not falling into um, those pitfalls. Of uh, finding just the the local minima, and that you're able to explore the space that we're actually trying to you're actually finding the true uh, global optimal answer. Thank you. Uh, we just had a new one just come in from Alex. What is the state of the art for optimization guided system identification? Are there methodologies or unified frameworks that can take you from a black box model or measured data to gray box with learned parameters? What is the state of the art for optimization guided system identification? I'll actually have to get back to you on that one. That would require a bit more thinking on my part. So please reach out to me so I can um, provide a more detailed answer. 
Perfect. Um, I believe that's all the questions we have today. Uh, I'd like to take thank Dr. Blue for her time. Uh, this is a great webinar. I uh, learned a lot today. Um, I think by by way of the chat, we can see that we had a, a very interactive audience, so they're very interested as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to her directly with more questions. Um, yes, please do. Please they were great questions. Sorry to interrupt. They were great questions, and I do want to give more detailed answers. So, yes, please do. Yeah, definitely. Um, and also reach out to CSI as well. Um, I put the webinar announcement page in the chat. That's where you can find today's slides. Uh, please also check back to that page within a couple of days, as well as our CSI YouTube page, where we will be posting a recording of this webinar as well. Um, I'll also, because the chat was so active, um, reach out to me if you would like a copy of uh, the Q&A session uh, so we can send that out to you as well. Um, and this will be our last webinar uh, for the year. So happy holidays and happy new year to everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays and new year.